Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, delegates to this wonderful webinar on building economic and business resilience, agility, and sustainability in post COVID era. What more can be relevant these days than this particular subject, and that too being organized by Globesyn? We have a galaxy of five excellent speakers. I will tell you about them just now. To start off with, my name is Sandeepan Chakravarti. I am the moderator of this event. And uh, my little background is I am a Tata man, rather a Tata Steel man, 45 years in Tata Steel, was managing director of a Tata company, chairman of three, and very much involved as a governing council member of Globsyn. <coughs> okay, that's about me. And before I go to the speakers, uh, let me talk to you about some hygiene matters of uh, this webinar before we get into it. The first point is, whatever questions you have, put all your questions in the chat section and mark them as question. Number two, if you're unable to hear a panelist, please check your internet, else communicate through chat. Number three, we are going to run a few polls during the session. Please participate such that we can deliberate during the session. Number four, an administrator from Globesyn with the name GBS Online Admin will be available on the chat session. Please look out for some important announcements. In case there is a major tech glitch, which should not happen, but even if it happened, do not leave the webinar. It will be refreshed in 30 seconds. If still not resolved, a new link will come on the chat session. Please go through the new link and you'll be on. To give you, the delegates, a brief profile of the eminent speakers we have on the dais today. I'll start off with Professor Dr. Mahendran S. Nair. He's a vice president R&D and professor, uh, vice president R&D and professor in Monash University, Malaysia. He's a professor of econometrics and business statistics, advisor to industry associations, economic planning unit, the PMO's office in Malaysia, currently leading a research team to study impact of science, technology and innovation on socioeconomic development. He's going to talk about many things, starting with building eco and business resilience and sustainability in post-COVID area. Then we come to the next speaker, would be uh, Dr. Uh, Tridip Mazumdar, Emeritus Professor of Marketing in Martin Whitman School of Management, Syracuse University. His background, a chemical engineer from IIT Kharagpur, MBA and PhD from Virginia Tech. His research has been published in several international journals and magazines. He's author of books. He's a visiting prof at Kellogg Grand School of Management and Northeastern University, Tuck School of Business, and many other things. He will be talking about the effect in retail, the devastation, and the reboot, and, and many other things. Then we have Professor Dr. Alfredo Behrens, IME University of Syracuse, Spain, and FIA, Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a PhD from University of Cambridge. His latest book on organizational leadership in Latin America in 2018 was nominated for a TV serial and was tops as the best Latino management book contest of 2018. He has written other books, he has contributed to journals like HPR, Finance Times, etc. He'll be talking about leadership for resilience and sustainability post COVID. And then we'll have Dr. David Becker, Bobker. Dr. David Bobker, my apologies. He is the Associate Professor of Risk Management in Malaysia University of Science and Technology. He also works as a risk management trainer and consultant. He's a DPhil from Oxford, a chartered accountant from UK. He has worked with, with KPMG, Deloitte. He has, uh, he has his own firm. He has a consulting firm in UK. In 2010, he moved to Malaysia to develop a risk management model of Bank of Negara. And his main interest is lies in IT and education. 
He has recently developed a new e-learning platform called the Learning Delivery Systems. He will be talking about use of technology, post-COVID, and other things. Their profiles are big and huge, and I don't want to continue more. I want to stop here. And before I give it to Rahul, let me introduce Rahul. Rahul is... Uh, He is the main architect, Rahul Das Gupta. He is the director and trustee of Globeson Business School. He is an alumnus of Durham Business School and UK and Wharton. He is a chief architect of Globeson Business School, where he merges industrial requirements with academics. He spearheads technology training in Globeson. He has trained over 180,000 engineering students, and he has many, many feathers to his cap. So he'll be talking right now, just as soon as I finish. He'll be talking right now. He'll be introducing Globsin and others. And I have requested Rahul to again to come back to the end to talk about resilience and sustainability. So over to you, Rahul, and start with her introduction, please. No sound. No earlier voice. OK. Thank you very much, sir. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everybody from different parts of the world. Uh, quickly, uh, I'll introduce uh, uh, groups in, in a minute or two, but thank you uh, for joining us for this uh, webinar. Um, and we see over 600 people participate uh, here today. Um, so Globsyn as an organization is a family-owned business. We were set up, uh, it was set up by my father, a uh, first-generation entrepreneur about 25 years ago. And uh, Essentially, we are in beautiful city of Kolkata, city of joy, as they call it in India, uh, West Bengal. And uh, when we were set up, the vision of the organization was to build institution and infrastructure in the city of Bengal. And over the years, uh, we have uh, sort of diversified into three verticals of businesses, uh, infrastructure, technology, and education. Um, we have about 2,500 uh, uh, employees, they are, so we are a big family, uh, uh, um, and essentially on the technology side, uh, we we work on uh, AI um, and uh, data analytics, and on the business side, starting even education, even. education um, we are in the postgraduate uh, 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 market, so we have our own private business school for almost two decades now. Um, and within the business school, we offer program program uh, and of course executive programs. So executive programs are mostly um, online and blended. Uh, we have about forty thousand students uh, in our executive channel, and on the full time program, we are we have four hundred full time MBA. So our entire ecosystem is mostly postgraduate. Uh, we do not uh, uh, teach undergraduate. So we have 40,000 on the uh, on the technology side, blended online, and about 400 in campus. So that's sort of our background, um, uh, essentially, uh, a little bit about Dobson. With that, I will uh, hand it back to uh, Sandeep and Sir you, uh, so that we can start the proceedings. Rahul, can you have the thank you, Rahul, for for the during this? Can you have everyone's telephone off? during the session yeah and rahul you better tell your uh, person that i can't see any uh, there is no video in front of me only a starting event going around but anyway i mean while some tech people can look into that now uh, let us continue to mr uh, rather to professor dr mahendran nair and uh, you may please start with the presentation please Dr. Nair. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, let me first uh, you know, thank uh, Globsyn for organizing this forum. And, uh, and this is a very uh, interesting time that we live. Um, we are living, um, you know, unprecedented changes and transformation that is happening. So what I'll do is, is in the first 10 minutes, I'll, I'll set the scene in terms of where we are, the, the context of the change that is happening and the transformation that is happening globally that is impacting uh, you know, the, the global community 
uh, you know, unprecedented, you know, since the 1920s and 1930s, we're experiencing this global phenomena. And I think, you know, uh, to set the scene, you know, uh, we need to understand the forces that are actually transforming the global uh, economy. Uh, and I think we are seeing that there are four major forces that are uh, in, in, in play. And uh, of course, the forces of globalization, you know, liberalization, opening up of the market. And then we had a fair bit of regionalization. And then now we have a lot more nationalization uh, within uh, the, the economies. Uh, and then the last force, which is really important, which is the digitization, which is really critical because the globalization has been there for a long time. But what we are seeing is that the digitization is you know, speeding up the rate of globalization, liberalization, and so on. So I want to focus here on four, uh, to understand this phenomena, there are four T's that we need to look at that is transforming the global economy. The first one is actually technology. Technology is racing ahead faster than institutions can cope with these changes. And we see that technology is transforming trade the way we do, uh, which is the second uh, T, which is trade. We're starting to see that, you know, technology is enabling uh, global supply chains to be more and more integrated. Uh, and, and we are seeing that any phenomena that happens in one part of the world is resonated in other parts of the world. We're seeing new business models uh, emerge, you know, using e-commerce and various technology platforms. Uh, we are seeing that virtual work, workforce is becoming increasingly important, but also we are starting to see that the industry 4.0 revolution is starting to take place where we are seeing that the cyber physical world, a lot more automation, we're seeing M2M, machine to machine, you know, AI systems that are running uh, the various operations. So that we're starting to see the trade and commerce is starting to change significantly. That is the second T. So the first T is technology, the second T is trade. The second aspect that is changing the global economy is actually transportation. Technology has now made it easier for people to travel across the globe. You know, we're starting to see, you know, greater mobility of people, goods, services, information, which is increasingly we're starting to see the flow of uh, people across the globe is phenomenal, especially now with India and China having access to, you know, increasing uh, uh, wealth and increasing access to technology and transportation. We're starting to see greater flow of people across the globe. The fourth T is actually transmission of information. With information comes market volatilities. And these volatilities are economic, financial. Now we are starting to see viruses. We used to have technology viruses. But today we are starting to see, uh, you know, uh, human, you know the, the biological viruses that are becoming more and more prevalent. And what we are seeing is that, you know, the pandemics have been there for the last 3,000 years. Even the last pandemic wasn't as, you know, the impact wasn't uh, intensive compared to this uh, recent pandemic. Partly because over the last 10 years, technology has enabled people to travel more, you know, intensively. We see a lot more people traveling and we're starting to see the transmission is more, uh, you know, much more faster. So we're starting to see the interlinkages between the three T's, which is technology, trade, transportation. So let me come down to how, let me come now to the COVID impact directly, which is, you know, COVID has got four major impact on the global economy. The first one, as I mentioned earlier, is the technology is integrating global supply chains. And we are starting to see that the first thing that happened, you know, sometime last year when China was impacted by COVID was that we, and China is one of the biggest supply, uh, biggest player, one of the biggest players in the supply chain. The moment the supply chain, the moment COVID started having a major impact on China, we started seeing that the supply chain was slowing down. And by January, February, it came to screeching halt. And clearly we saw that, you know, many of the firms across the board, across the globe, started, you know, having difficulty getting their supplies and, and we're starting to see that now, because of the transmission and, and interlinkages between the supply chain, we started seeing that the supply was starting to have an adverse impact across the globe. And we, that is the first impact. The second thing is that we started seeing governments starting to lock down quickly because the worry of, you know, uh, uh, spreading of this virus and that lockdown, not only, you know, lockdown on transportation, it started having a knock-on effect on tourism and all the related industries. and 
the worst thing is that we started seeing that firms were starting to the people could not go to you know work and slowly we are starting to see what is a supply shock was starting to creep into the demand side income levels started going down people are losing jobs we started seeing that the demand start started shifting backwards so we have a contraction of both the supply side and the demand side and what is really fascinating was that we are starting to see now uh, productivity starting to come down. You know, what was built over the last few years, last 10 years, was starting to be wiped out in the first two to three months of that. And interestingly, you know, markets were getting very jittery. And in countries that are affected, markets, you know, financial markets were starting to pull out. So we see that the four effects of supply chain impact, we're starting to see the demand side, the productivity side starting to have an impact. And, you know, we're starting to see investors getting really worried. And this is a perfect storm or perfect recipe for recession and a global depression. And this is what is major worry. So, and as government started increasing the lockdown, and I think it was the necessary, um, uh, you know, uh, um, you know uh, thing, because otherwise the transmission would have gone really high. But nevertheless, the economic impact is phenomenal. And we assessed, you know, in uh, across the globe, and we assessed in, in Malaysia, particularly one of the countries that is very fairly open and, and dependent on the supply chain. We interviewed many industry captains, and they were all reeling from this uh, impact. We saw that almost, you know, 92% were adversely impacted. And, and we saw that, you know, when we asked them what are the major concerns, you know, almost 96% of them found that, you know, financial... Yeah, the immediate financial position was, was in jeopardy, you know, and almost 73% expected that the incomes will, will drop significantly. This is a major, you know, part of the, the economy. So clearly the top concerns were financial impact, immediate financial impact, you know, the ability to 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 to, to have mm -hmm. cash, you know, worry of global recession because you know demand conditions going down, and many of them are worried, you know, they have to close shop. And we saw that many of the liquidity problems started having an impact on whether they survived or not. And you know, almost 23% said that within three months, if they did not have the economy revive, they would be in deep trouble. You know, and so we started seeing this knock-on effect on the economy. But nevertheless, we started seeing that firms realized that you know they have to really change their business model. And during the crisis, we started seeing firms starting to reinvent. And Malaysia was fairly dependent on foreign labor and, and still, you know, many sectors were labor intensive. Many of them over the last two to three months had to reinvent and bring in better technology. And, and we see that, you know, the focus was essentially to, you know, change their business model, get the business up and running. You know, cost was a major issue. And we started seeing that many of them were starting to change their portfolio of investment, moving more in terms of uh, technology driven. Uh, you know, and also starting to expand their market reach uh, beyond what their borders are. So while, you know, there were major challenges that put many of the businesses, <coughs> so we started seeing many of the businesses pay setter or what I call them, you know, they started becoming more creative and innovative to look at new business model. So to summarize, uh, you know, uh, we see that technology has positive impact and has also got a downside. But to address the downside, we need to be able to use the same sources of that, that the challenges, which is technology itself. And I think one of the first things from, from any economy perspective is that there's this notion of trade-off between saving livelihood versus saving lives. You know, and we see that you know countries are you know opening up the, the economies, but we are starting to see the second wave of transmission. And this is economies are grappling with this. But how do we address this? And I think you know. We can't decouple the healthcare ecosystem from the economic ecosystem, and we know this. And this is where I think, you know, one of the first things that we need to, as economists and as corporate sector and as policymakers, is to we need to be able to address the healthcare system in a much more, uh, you know, intensive way. And this is where using technology to be able to preempt crises, health crises, you know, in some countries, in some countries, even before the pandemic took place in China, they already knew. So Korea and Taiwan and others were able to quickly close their borders, put in their system, and 
address their supply chain. So we started seeing that you know technology can be used to you know create a very agile and resilient healthcare system. You know, taking preemptive measures. You know, advising policymakers on what needs to be done. Every economy needs to address that. Second thing is that we are we need to have you know more smarter way of managing our businesses and the workforce, and I think uh, you know our, during a crisis particular like this, I think investments firms nor governments cannot cut back on investments in technology. As a matter of fact, technology investment must be counter cyclical to business cycles. During the crisis is when they need to be able to you know uh, invest in technology to give them the leverage. So I think the way business models, they're going to change. This, this pandemic will change workforce, our business operation, and we'll see that Industry 4.0 technology will be intensified. So we're going to start seeing new innovative models coming through. And this is one of the ways to address both the supply side, both how firms operate on the ground, and also consumers uh, get access to services and so on. And I think without this, you know, business confidence is going to be really difficult. And this is where I see that the opportunity for tech sectors, you know, to reinvent, ensuring that, you know, there are innovative technology that is, you know, making its way into healthcare, agriculture, a wide spectrum of industries. Uh, and Industry 4.0 is not just in manufacturing, it's across all industries. And I think if we get that business model right, and I think it will, uh, you know, during this crisis, you know, even after coming out of the depression, we saw that, you know, the 1929-30 depression, we had the best technology growth. And I think that the same thing will happen coming out of this crisis. We'll see innovative firms, new business models, new sectors emerging. And I'm fairly positive that I think, you know, um, you know, I think firms need to bite the bullet and invest into technology, into people, and also into the governance systems, which I'll talk about later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nair. I think it was a wonderful presentation where you brought in your four T's. You spoke about technology and you spoke about uh, the human face and you spoke about uh, you, you spoke about how to retain and improve the health system. And uh, you concluded on a very, very optimistic note that there'll be a lot of changes. So let us get an equally and I'm sure we'll have equal good news for the future. And so now it is over to Dr. Tridip Mazumda for his presentation, please. Thank you. Um, I, first, let me thank uh, uh, let me thank um, Globsin Business School for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to provide a perspective on this extremely important topic. It has touched all our lives. It has touched every aspect of businesses. And everyone is somehow affected by this uh, devastation uh, uh, that is caused by COVID-19. Um, I would like to take a position that, yes, this is causing a lot of grief, a lot of misery for a lot of people. But this has presented to us uh, an opportunity to re look at our or revisit our business models, revisit our lives and see we can transition to a better future and create opportunities where um, we can rethink how we have been doing our businesses and, and so on. So I, I also, like uh, Professor Nair, uh, take a more optimistic view about COVID as we pass. I don't know when that will happen, maybe a year, year and a half, when things will normalize. But it definitely poses a challenge for all the businesses to really look at how they have been doing their businesses and what else they can do so they can transition to a better world. So let me give you a little, some of the facts um, uh, pertaining to US economy, how COVID has affected us. Um, and then um, use retail as an example to illustrate how um, COVID has affected uh, that part of the economy because retail is right in front of us. We can see when the stores open, we can see when the stores close and no one is around. So it is kind of a, a, a always present in front of us 
as a, as a way to show how uh, the economy is getting affected. So these are some of the facts. Uh, two, two point, this is all uh, in the US economy, 2.3 million cases so far until yesterday. And 121,000 deaths in the United States. That's an astounding number. 40 million people, which accounts for about 14.7 million are unemployed. And there's a GDP decline of 4%. 4 so immediately we are in recession. So um, how that will reflect to all of our lives in terms of spending habits and so on will, will be something to watch out. Now, these are aggregate pictures, but if we look at individual sectors, healthcare, healthcare industry has been affected very badly. And the way they have been affected is mostly in terms of capacity, in terms of beds, in terms of ICU facilities and equipments. And also they have been postponing some of the other healthcare activities like um, which are elective surgeries and so on. So they have been pushing those on the side until they can take care of the COVID patients for now. So healthcare industry is at a brink and they're operating at capacity. Hospitality industries, there are 80% vacancy, which is actually quite an optimistic picture now. If at one time there were, uh, there were almost 90, 94% hotel rooms are vacant. So they are going through a really, really bad time. And this is something no one knows when the business travels will actually expand. Airline travels, 95% decline in the airline industries. Many aircrafts are grounded on the tarmac. Education is another which you used to think that they're immune from all these external shocks. Now education is seeing that 25% of revenue decline, mostly in terms of enrollment decline, but also in terms of other revenue sources like athletic programs uh, and um, other facilities they, they provide to students. Uh, so those have declined significantly. Retail has declined on average 24%. Um, and so we can see how that in sector has been affected. So, so I would like to use retail as just a case study. Uh, not, not, not because this is more or less important than other industries, but it is something that we see in our daily lives and how it has affected it. So it accounts for 16% of US economy. So it is really a bulk of the US economy. And in fact, this is a predictive, uh, this is predictive of how the overall economy is, uh, is working. So lockdown has affected all retail sector categories all of them. So every every part of the retail has been affected. Grocery has gone down 13.2%, department stores 28.9%, restaurants and bars 29%, clothing and accessory an astounding 78.8%. Nobody is buying clothes anymore, shoes or anything, anything like that. Um, obviously one trend you can see, the it, it depends, this variation depends upon the essential nature of the product and the proximity between the seller and the buyer. So if we can, if we can do it without touching anyone, without interacting with anyone, then that those industries, those sectors are less affected by that. And also how much you need that product. One interesting thing is online non-store retailers, actually the revenue has gone up by 8.4%. So that is to be expected. People are buying online. So those stores who do not have a brick and mortar presence, they have benefited quite a bit from new customers. So I'm divided into four stages that consumers have gone through and how retailers have responded to it. The first thing we see is a panic and despair. And uh, I remember when the lockdown was de declared in our state, um, the stores were immediately emptied out. So there are panic buying and stockpiling of essential products, medications, water, cleaning supplies, disinfectants, toilet papers, basic non-perishable food items. So they went and stocked up for those who have the place to you know, preserve them. Now retailer at that point, how would they react to these kinds of reactions? The immediate reaction, immediate reaction was safety. 
So safety of their own employees and safety of the customers. So they immediately reconfigured their store uh, aisles so that the customers do not come close to each other. They allocated certain times when people could come and they controlled the number of people who are coming to the retail environment. Procurement and supply chain was another thing. So one big change in the retail industries was local procurement. So instead of relying on faraway providers, they started relying on local producers, which in some way has benefited the environment and also benefited local, local producers as well. Second stage, you know, even if our uh, Trump has been saying that this is a hoax, uh, people soon realize it is not a hoax. It's going to be here. So they resigned to the fact that pandemic is going to stay for us and they began to adjust their lifestyles and similarly, the retailers also did that. So first thing that happened, people looked at their own spending habits and they did some sorting of their needs. What is only essential, that is something they were trying to buy. So they completely minimized their impulse purchases. They looked for contact-free purchases. There are new social formats and norms that became, uh, became prevalent, like Zoom and in-house entertainment homeschooling, remote learning, that, that is how the, the community and the consumers have been there. Retailers have been focusing on fulfillment of orders. How do I take the product to the customers? So these curbside deliveries uh, and home deliveries became very, very prominent. And that's what we are going through even now, the, where we order online and wait at the, at the curb and they come and deliver the products to us. Third stage is the, the, the disruption and it is becoming a new normal. People are beginning to really rethink, as Professor Nair says, they're looking for technology solutions. What is going to happen in the future? And we can see all of these happening. The e-commerce is booming at this point in time. And e-healthcare, which is telemedicine, is becoming a norm and hospitals and healthcare providers are taking a note of it. It's a cheap and uh, effective way to deliver uh, healthcare. Electronic inter entertainment, as Netflix and few others have seen. Curbside and home deliveries and social distancing is there. The downside of the, this is the, the psychology of the consumers is the fear and suspicion. Nobody, nobody is taking the other person for granted. They're staying away from, away from them. Now, this is where the hope comes in, is the rejuvenations and growth, okay? Mm -hmm. There are some permanent disruptions that will take place. The industry-wide shakeup is taking place very, very clearly. A number of retailers have gone bankrupt, particularly those who had weak financials, and those are somewhat ineffective. JC Penney is going out of business. The Neiman Marcus is, is declaring bankruptcies. And so those things are going to be permanent negatives uh, of the, of the, of the COVID-19. Now, hopefully with vaccination, no one knows when that is going to come. I just put a number is June, 2021, whether that will be the right vaccinations with perfect results. Slowly, hopefully the COVID fear will, will diminish. Now, this is the time for all the businesses to rethink their current business models. This is the time they need to really make a transition from what they have been doing for the last 50, 60 years, and then look at the new ways of solving their current problems. And obviously, as Dr. Nair said, that technology solutions is one thing that people are going to first look at. Most of the technology companies are looking for solutions. And as we can see in you know, the platforms that they're creating, um, so the way people can look at uh, products that from home and try out their products. For example, they have mannequins and they have robots that they are showing as to how the person will look with the different types of uh, clothing or apparels or any other things. Sourcing and supply chain will, will completely change quite a bit. These far away, 10,000 miles away, things are coming. They're going likely to be more locals and the supply chain is going to be much more streamlined than what it has been in, in the future. Heavy analytics are going to be, be playing a big role. 
artificial intelligence or predictive algorithms and those kinds of things are going to be used significantly more to predict the demands and the supplies. And obviously that will result in the new prices and so on. Now, obviously a lot of people are doing geo-targeting, like where things are okay to go, where things are dangerous to go. Those are kinds of things that is causing segmentations. So let me conclude by providing some of the other industries that have opportunities in every sector. Higher education, being from higher education, this is very near and dear to me. You know, we have these very rigid models, two semesters, three semesters, students will come, they will go into classes, the business schools and other schools are spending millions and millions of dollars in creating classroom environment and technologies. And these are extremely high capital intensive and high fixed cost orientations. So higher education needs to think, go beyond just remote learning. They need to think about how we offer our contents to the students. Does it have to be that one and a half hour sessions or should it be a 24 hours every day things are available that students can decide when they will come, access the content and take exams and pass out. And so those are things that higher education needs to think about. Why do we have to have such expensive facilities and with student experience? Now, of course, students will complain that um, am I going to uh, university just to learn from a distance or do they also need student life as a, as, a, as a way to learn? Now, those are things that higher education will have to take care of asking the basic questions. Why are we here? Are we only to educate people or are we going to create other kinds of uh, opportunities for students? Hospitality is another one and the, the more um, uh, affected ones are, the, are not the small motels and so on. They're still getting some travel um, uh, guests and so on. But this making of 700, 1000 room hotels uh, is it really the effective way to look at things? Of course, they will have conferences, they will have weddings and those kinds of things, but they need to have a mix of low budget, smaller units, uh, rather than these behemoths that they, they have created. The airlines has to really think about, will business travel sustain the industry? Is that what their bread and butter are going to be going forward? Business travel is definitely going to go down, at least in the near term and so on. Healthcare, telemedicine is coming as a, as a norm. And I, I personally do telemedicine with my physicians. A lot of things you do not need to visit visit the, um, the, your, uh, your doctor to take bl your blood pressures or your uh, other small checkups. Those can be easily done at home and can be transmitted to your healthcare providers and so on. Working from home is going to be here to stay. Uh, no matter what, they found it not only to be a low cost way to operate, but it is also becoming more efficient. The productivity has gone up. Half of the time in our offices, we spend chatting with people. Now that, that may also be there. We may turn off our work and go watch some TV but there is a clear work-life balance that is going to come and, and play with us. Of course, there is a strong environmental effect. The, we do not have to travel one hour to commute on each way, um, and, and that might improve the environment quite a bit. So let me uh, conclude um, my presentations with this, and I'm open to taking any questions. And Rahul, thank you for organizing this. Okay. Thank I'm you, Trudeep. It was an excellent presentation. Yep. Uh, excellent presentation. So can, I, yeah. can I just say one thing? I think uh, some of the people have mentioned about some connection and sound problems. So I just want to recommend two things uh, to the audience. If you're having a sound problem, I would recommend you to log out and log back in or, or re log in. And we will put our mics on mute as we are talking. That should also address some of the problems. Thank you. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Pridip, again, for an excellent presentation. We'll come back to you later. But uh, right now, I would like to go to Alfredo Behans for his talk on leadership for resilience and sustainability post-COVID and other matters. Alfredo. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I get organized properly. Can you hear me all? And can you read my presentation in the sense it's reading clearly from left to right? Yes? Good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Globin, for inviting me. It, it is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to be with such distinguished uh, professionals here. Uh, and I loved uh, listening to your presentations uh, up to now. Uh, Mahinder gave us a big picture one. Tridip gave us a more focused one. I will discuss uh, the not the next year, not the next two or three years, but perhaps three to five years in the type of leadership that we need in order to move forward. We need to understand what worked properly now in order to understand what leverage we will have in the future. And there is a role for business schools as well in order to provide the leadership that at this moment many corporations have lacked. So this is what I will focus on. Uh, it, it is a difficult topic, but it's a fun one. <laughs> and I would love to answer the questions that you may have later on. Let me see. Uh, uh, the, the countries that did better uh, were the ones that had politicians that asked people to collaborate. They coalesced the people it, together to bring them together, and the people responded. These were countries like Korea, Germany, Japan, New Zealand, Uruguay, all across the globe. What these leaders had in common was that they asked people to collaborate. Now, the societies that were polarized before this event of the pandemic, those didn't do as well. And there is a reason for it. You know, uh, some of these, the ones that did worst, for example, Belgium, <laughs> Spain, United Kingdom, Italy, these were countries that before the pandemic had great difficulty even in forming a government. So you wouldn't expect them to be very effective when the pandemic struck. Uh, then you have the case of the USA, major power in the world, but it comes out ninth in terms of effectiveness. So uh, there is a lesson there. Uh, we, we had leaders that were more effective than others. And those leaders that were more effective were calling for collaboration. So uh, the struggle of against the COVID-19 was largely a struggle for politicians and scientists. Those were the ones that provided us the leadership. But it's strange because we had very few corporations giving us an idea of where we were and where we were heading. Uh, I remember John Byers and Bob Dylan, you know, lately a Nobel Prize, but he had this song, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Well, actually, most of the leaders of the very large corporations disappeared during the pandemic. Uh, uh, and these were leaders of very large corporations. I mean, Apple's earning yearly are larger than the whole GDP of Portugal, Volkswagen larger than Chile, Walmart larger than Belgium, Amazon larger even than Kuwait. But yet these leaders did not come forth. And this is something that we have to think about because we were left with the old politicians and the scientists to get back. So there is something that we have not been doing properly in terms of management. We would expect that corporations which are so large would be led by people that have something in mind besides you know speaking about performance about earnings before and after taxes or after depreciation or interest payments there is much more for us to be working for than just you know the standard fare of performance so uh, let us go back to why these leaders came into position in that way if we think when all this started, and I'm not going to go all the way back to the Egyptians and wherever, no, no, it's Gutenberg with mobile, mobile types and his printing press. They, these parts have one advantage, they are interchangeable. And so the Americans picked it up after a long time. You know, Thomas Jefferson was present in Paris when this system was presented by armors to make weapons. So this competition by costs uh, and by standardizing products is what made America so effective. 
they were willing to try new methods of production. They got off their feet and went on and doing it. But the standardization as a paradigm for interchangeable parts may have gone too far. So this is why we started getting templates. So how people should dress up in order to go to work. Uh, because people had to be standardized. There was no need for that, but you know, the way that people looked uh, was better. And they ended up looking all very much like the same. <laughs> it's pretty hard to distinguish one from the other, except for the colors of their ties. Uh, and that's not, that shouldn't be like that. So essentially what happened was the whole paradigm of interchangeable parts split over to human resource management. So now the problem was quite simple. We know the jobs that are necessary, that are on offer, the skills that we need to fill them up. So let's fit in the puzzle and getting the people together in a corporation allowed them becoming very standardized to also be very mobile because a national market was created for labor. So the workers became very mobile. Now that is a crucial aspect that we had to think about because if they were mobile, they could leave the city that they were born in. And if they've left the city, they might not leave with the whole family. And looking for the best prospects of their performance and earnings, they would move away. So loyalty was fractured. Loyalty to the place, loyalty to the co-workers, eventually even loyalty to the family. This has been going on for a long time. It's not all recent. Uh, this is why I took the trouble to figure it out since when uh, treason, <laughs> has become no less important. Fraud has become less important. It, the importance of these uh, terms, treason and fraud, have been declining systematically since the 18th century. It's not as important now as it used to be before. Dante had put uh, treason in the lowest of all circles of hell. But now it's not more important than gluttony is. So there has been a drop in values, of societal values, of what address the need to collaborate rather than to take advantage of the others. So I think that the whole system of management has run its, its period. It's over. I mean, uh, look at the American artists as good as Hopper or White. They decried loneliness of the American. They moved away too far. They dropped friends. Huh? And then they started forgetting about their families. And grannies were being dumped. They are still being dumped. A 1992 article in the New York Times has that title. Grannies being dumped by the thousands. And so sociology started pointing out, listen, Americans are bowling alone. There are no more leagues now. They don't join unions. They don't join the Parents' Teacher Association anymore. In 1971, a film director produced this film. Uh, in which you had people shooting randomly, people that were on the way to the groceries. And it was a black comedy, but we never imagined that it would be so prescient what happened later. Mass murders becoming more frequent and more lethal than ever before. Now, if you can escape the shooting, you might have to choose being committing suicide because what has been happening is that the people that felt left out from this phenomenal growth have been committing suicide at a rate that was not expected. And particularly during their more productive years, left out in despair, they commit suicide, they opt out. Now, this is a very important signal that something is very wrong. This is what, uh, in, in the time of the colonization of the Americas, uh, slaves would do to the children. They would kill them because they thought that that was not a worth living. And now we are back to the same, but not only in the States, because what happens is that when you give precedence to performance and productivity, then you leave many people behind. And it's happening, of course, in India as well where you have uh, the drop in the income from farmers have led to their uh, choice of also opting out and at the same age bracket of the Americans who are committing suicide. And these should be our most productive age. So you see, a system of production and organization for production has had this trait. You can't choose 
the system and all, by only one side of it. The awesome, uh, fabulous progress that we have enjoyed uh, in technology for the last 200 years. It came with all these downsides as well. So what we have to think is what kind of new normal do we want for the future? Uh, because we, the whole issue now is building back better. Mahinder mentioned of the need for governance. Uh, and yes, yes, but this also means that we need to treat people in a different way, select them in a different way. Uh, because if you are aware in the US now, which Trudeau was presenting us this, uh, picture of. Black people uh, become less hospitalized and they die more than white people. No, that, that's not fair, is it? And if on top of that we see that a black person has been killed by a white police officer kneeling on his neck, well, obviously that creates a lot of anger, right? And, and this anger has consequences. And corporations that were not uh, available to give us any solace or guidance during the COVID-19 saw this and decided, oh, we've got a Band-Aid. <laughs> now, now, pay attention, because Johnson & Johnson had put out these colorful Band-Aids in 2015, but they thought it was not worth it. But they took chance of this moment and saying, oh, we have to do something about it. Okay, fine, it's good. Uh, now we have colors of band-aids to choose from. But it, it's, it doesn't really look very well. Uh, and it's surprising that after two centuries of phenomenal growth, the issue of color is still with us, as if production was geared more for making profits than actually satisfying people's needs. It was okay at the beginning of the last century if Ford would only produce black cars. But now producing only pink band-aids doesn't make any more sense than it did. So these are the issues that we have to look up uh, because we are producing in our business schools uh, people that would lead these industries for the future. It's pretty hard to produce anything. Of course, I know to innovate even harder, but it doesn't seem that we are producing the leaders who we would like to have. What we need to understand is that competition within uh, organizations fractures them uh, and that it produces the type of bosses uh, that lead fractious organizations and perhaps this is why we heard so little of them when we needed them most and we were left with the politicians and the scientists to lead us so what i would like to call is the possibility of looking deeper into what we have available in each one of our societies and see which are the examples of collaboration that people love doing for very low pay? And we have the Mumbai Dabawalas. Uh, they have excellent performance and they sing while they work. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? And then you have the Palampuri Jains in the diamond trade. Uh, they, they, they actually don't have any written contracts despite working in, with very high value goods. They could disappear, but they don't because people are trusted when they collaborate. And of course, we have the, the Kolkata Durga Puja here and many other Pujas in India. Uh, so with this message, I'm concluding with a more optimistic idea. Yes, we have had uh, difficulties, significant difficulties in combating COVID. And we were left mostly with scientists and politicians to deal with. Corporations were very absent. And when they became present, they didn't in the way that we would expect. Unilever now in India is phasing out its fair and fair and beautiful, I think it's called, and right, in order to give you a whiter skin. Now, uh, these are simply opportunistic moves. We need deeper understanding that in order to build a better world together, to build back better, we need more collaboration than our forms of producing have produced up to now. So these are the things that I would like to leave you in, in your mind and just leave it to my colleagues and to discuss later if you have questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Alfredo. It was a lovely presentation, quite a departure, and it was a very easy and a very easy sounding and a very understandable one. Thank you. Now we come to Dr. David Bobka, and the presentation is yours. Your mic, your microphone is off. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, sitting here in uh, the UK. It's uh, just about the middle of summer, but you'll notice I'm wearing a rather warm fleece in any case, um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, I was just saying it, it probably falls to me uh, to be the bad cop element of the good cop, bad cop duo, because we've all been very optimistic so far. I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't actually share the great optimism, so I'd just like to give you a few points before I talk about the educational aspects, which I'm more interested in. But I'd just like to say that, um, uh, for just to put it in perspective, for example, in Britain, where I'm sitting, um, uh, GDP during the first quarter declined 20%, which was basically... 10 times greater than any, any previous quarter ever recorded. Um, so the world has had a gigantic shock, and I was surprised not to hear the economists talking about U-shape, V-shape recoveries, L-shape and W-shape. Um, the IMF um, uh, published its latest uh, World Economic Outlook, which seemed to suggest pretty much a rapid V-shape recovery. I'm not sure why they did, but frankly, I think we should all be very prepared that that may not happen. And there's a few other things as well, uh, which we need to think about, because the tremendous recession um, that we're going to have, which has been likened to the depression of the 30s. And I would just like to remind you that the depression of the 30s was actually only ended by World War Two. I think most people now agree with that. Um, and this is what we don't want. Um, the other point to bear in mind is that this pandemic is by no means over. But economically, we've had this massive shock. And it's going to take quite some time for that to work through. So there's various scenarios we can think of. But I think bouncing back to where we were fairly rapidly is not a viable scenario. So really, we want the politicians to be planning for what the likely scenarios are. And I've heard um, one epidemiologist um, through private communications through friends who believes that, the, that this epidemic could actually go on for another three to five years, notwithstanding vaccines. So the idea we're going to get back to where we were. One other thing to add to that, by the way, the human cost, because with all these businesses going bankrupt, we, we we need to think about all the mass unemployment which is going to occur. And that's something I would like to address in my own presentation, which I promise I will start in a moment. Um, what's going to happen to the mass unemployment that's created by the permanent downsizing of many businesses that are going to fail or at least going to be out of action for a long time? Ultimately, history shows that um, we will readjust and those people will do other jobs. And that's always the answer that when we get new technology uh, destroying jobs, that fear is always assuaged by the thought that eventually people will do different jobs. So we need to be thinking about that. So there's massive problems that's going to be created by this huge shock um, to the world economy. And, you know, unfortunately, the other thing to throw into the mix and relating to Professor Burns's talk about leadership, um, almost universally our politicians are incompetent. Um, actually, it was it was quite a joy to listen on, on Radio 4 only a couple of days ago. I've recorded it in case anyone said it didn't happen. Um, the ex-head of MI6, which you may know is the British Secret Service, you know, it would be James Bond's boss if he existed. Um, he was asked about President Trump. He just said on air, well, of course, uh, President Trump is completely incompetent to be president of the United States. And we all knew that when he was running. He just threw that out as a line, which, which very few people have said, but that's the ex-head of MI6. 
Anyway, with all of this uh, doom and gloom, um, which will have to be faced up to, and India, of course, you're going to have even more unemployed. You're, I cannot believe you've got away with the, you've got away with the, uh, in the pandemic, uh, comparatively likely. I, I fear that the uh, full force of the pandemic is yet to show itself in India. For example, in the UK, it's well known people of South Asian origin, and this has been hotly debated at the moment, the reasons um, are about five to 10 times more likely to succumb to a fatality of COVID than, than other people. So I think you've got quite a lot to be dealing with. Anyway, let me turn to something less, less doom and gloom, if I may. Um, I must say one of the great things about uh, the lockdown and all that has been, if you've got WhatsApp or social media, the kind of the satirical funny videos have been have been quite marvelous i mean that's about the, that's that's about the really the really great thing that happened um in the early days we mentioned what happened in retail we we kicked off with that well there's a marvelous video of retail shelves and i went shopping myself into a big supermarket the shelves were totally totally bare um you went into the but you went into the alcohol section it was totally empty this was, I mean, even more than the rest of the store, except, except for cases and cases of Corona beer. <laughs> nobody, bought, nobody bought that. So these things at least have given us a bit of, uh, a bit of hope that the sense of humor and uh, the human spirit is not dead, but we still have a lot to deal with. Let me just talk about what I wanted to talk about, which is really where I think online education um, is, is, going to, is going to go. Um, I think this probably won't be particularly changed by what's happened. It just may th may speed up things, as in other cases, with uh, we've been talking about artificial intelligence and its impact, and that may be something which which uh, comes through faster. So, what I want to talk about is uh, online education and the lockdown. Um, what is the nature of online learning at the moment? Where we might be heading? And just a few words um, on my opinions of AI. Now, I have to tell you, this is based on my own experience, having developed a system which I've been testing and using at my own university, um, which has some of the features were mentioned about uh, systems that you're thinking about, um, but it doesn't contain any kind of original research or anything other than what I've been doing. So what's happened with the lockdown? Well, here, um, lockdown closed all the universities and the schools, of course, and in the UK here, one of, the, one of the major debates going on is when uh, children can get back to school. Um, and the, the government, by the way, for those of you who are studying leadership and management, please study the UK political experience, because I'm gonna tell you, and, and I've used this in, in some training recently, it's the, the British political response to the COVID crisis is an absolute object lesson in how not to show leadership because they, they have ticked just about every box on what not to do to manage a crisis. The number of U-turns, backtracking, um, unclear communication has been phenomenal. Um, so what's happened with schools has is, is illustrated that. They said they're not going back to school, then they said they are going back to school, then there was an outcry and now they're not going back to school, but this is what's been happening. But We've had online education for some time. For example, we've got the MOOC, we've got the EDX in the US, and there's piles of uh, free courses online. Uh, my friend, um, who was an old trader from AB and AMRO, well retired, but still likes to learn, he just did a CS50 course, Introduction to Computer Science. And I just noticed that he's just finished that. Over 2 million people have registered. So of course, online education has really taken off. But the pandemic then has brought into focus the idea of online education. So the question is, to what extent is it going to persist um, after the pandemic, if indeed there is going to be such a, a thing? And as I say, one scenario there isn't. What's it going to look like? To what extent are we going to go back to face-to-face uh, -face learning? Um, someone mentioned one of the fine expressions just before called the, the new normal. Um, that's what everyone's talking about and wondering what it's going to be. So what will the new normal look like um, in education? And then where could technology supported education be headed longer term? 
Um, some industries, as we've noted, have been very badly hit by the, uh, by the virus. Um, hospitality has been wiped out. Airlines are in, are in, desperate, are in desperate trouble. Um, retailing, of course, not to mention um, the hospitality industry in general. Um, will people be eating out again? They're just discussing now, should we have two meters or one meter in the UK? Are we going to have pubs? Can you imagine with, uh, with plastic, plastic perspex barriers between people in a pub in Britain? Um, I don't see that happening somehow. So let's have a look at online learning as it is now. Um, I think it's the same as the development of a lot of things. The first thing you want to try and do is to, is to kind of automate, if I can call it that, automate things that you had before. So by that I mean before we had lectures and textbooks, so now we have a lot of video lectures and PDF documents, which just, which just put onto soft uh, format, computer format uh, books as such. Now, this is not what I would call truly online learning. Um, and similarly, uh, professional qualifications have a lot of online courses. I've even looked at one or two myself recently. Um, Sometimes you get what I call ebook style, such as Kindle, Kobo, and so on, and that is quite different from the PDF style. We have things called learning management systems, and there's quite a lot of those around learning platforms. But frankly, those are really repositories uh, for links to documents and upload, download links to videos, and so on and so on. They have options for things they call quizzes which are useful as an add-on to help uh, do self-testing. But these kind of uh, quizzes seem to be kind of um, afterthoughts rather than integral parts of assessment, um, which is something different, which I would like to talk about. So what's missing from where we are now? Um, I think what's missing is something which we needed anyway, and that's what I call the interactive element. So how do people really learn? Do people learn from lectures? I don't think so. When I went to lectures, people learned nothing. Very little anyway. In, in my day, the lecturer was still actually writing on the board in chalk. I'm not joking. Um, and we all sat there. Now, why, why did people go to lectures at all? Uh, actually, I've got a very cynical friend um, who, who just pointed out the obvious answer. People go to lectures to meet girls or boys or whatever. That's, that's the only reason they go. And, and this was mentioned before, which was the social element in education. And I think it would be good to actually grapple with the social element as being crucial, um, but not pretend that, that giving lectures is helping people learn things. So I believe learning by doing, really, and especially training, uh, which I do more of, is learning by doing is the way really to learn. So Unless people, I mean, there's a saying that you, you can't really teach anyone anything. They have to learn themselves. Um, you can lecture for days and people may not get it until they actually get their hands dirty and do things and really think about things and produce things. That's the point. Now, I mentioned things like uh, documents, PDFs and, and uh, Word documents and so on. What's wrong with that? Well, very simply, they don't contain interaction. And what's worse, they don't scale. So the other crucial element which needs to be taken into account is uh, this, the handheld. Um, people work day and night with handhelds. Younger generation um, obviously are going to spend most of their time with handheld devices, their phones and so on. And I discovered the, ray, the way to really know if you're up with <laughs> modern technology and modern generation is this, I believe. Can you, can you do a, um, a text with two fingers, two thumbs, or do you just use one? That is the real test if you're interested. But the truth is we are using, we are using uh, mobile technology a lot more. So what we want is scalable mobile technology that contains interaction um, and the focus on handheld devices. And try reading a PDF or a set of slides on handheld devices. Um, it, it, it just doesn't work. So I'll say a bit more about this in a second. Um, in addition, the other part of online and automation in education is um, automating lots of tasks, especially marking. Now, the reason I started developing my system uh, some years ago, frankly, as a lecturer, and I was new to lecturing, I was horrified. I had 50 students in a class, 
um, which I was appalled with, and and I had to mark all their stuff. And I thought, no, no, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> so I developed the system for numerical subjects. It works, and the marking is all automated, which is which is better. But it's not just for me to get out of doing doing that sort of job. But let's face it, mark anything which should be mundane and automated should be automated. Um, but the other thing was it gave a lot more chance and opportunity for students to actually get their hands dirty and really start working themselves with just thousands and thousands of tests and examples. And that way, I found I had an incredible success. So let me talk about what might be thought of as the ideal, where we might be going. Um, what would be the requirements? Well, I think the first thing that springs to mind would be artificial intelligence. I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And can I just link back to what I led with on uh, economic impact? Artificial intelligence, the, the, and the debate is, or should be, although it's been postponed, because the recession and the virus have just put all these things. And by the way, climate change has not gone away, my friends. It is still there in a big way, especially in your part of the world, by the way, uh, that, that you will be well, be well aware of. Um, AI, is it going to, like, like automation, the fear was in the early 20th century, mass production, is it going to do away with thousands and thousands of jobs and is it going to add to all the unemployment and so on? Or are people going to find different jobs? And this is the big question. I think however you turn it, though, this time, if, I, if AI is taking over the, the simplest sort of reasoning jobs, then... For, for people to have room for jobs with robotics and so on, then they're going to have to be better educated. And so education, it seems to me, is the place that, that governments really need to get their, their head around and make the biggest focus of spending and investment for the future. Because frankly, we're not going to need the millions of people doing many, many types of jobs which are going to be automated away. So it's the, the, the time for, for preparing for this, actually, I would guess we're already half to three quarters of the way through and we've still not done anything, you know, rather like President Trump and preparing for COVID. So we will, you know, it's, it's been kind of conventional wisdom, as I say, that the doomsday scenarios in the past never came to pass. Um, because in the in the various automation revolutions of the past, you know, the 16th, 17th centuries, machines, the steam age, railways, all of that, computer age, it's never happened. But this time, it's a question of speed, isn't it? Eventually, the world will, will, the world will amend. But the question is, how long will the disruption last? And that needs some preparation and thinking. And for heaven's sake, that needs competent politicians. Personally, I wouldn't allow anyone to lead a country without a PhD from a decent university. I think there's only one country got it, which is Germany. And by the way, by the way, CNN, uh, which I sometimes look at for an alternative view of British news, though it's pretty much the same, um, did a quite an interesting article. Why is it that the um, that that country leaders who happen to be women did rather better in COVID than anywhere else? Um, that's also something else to think about. Anyway. The key points that I would like to make at the moment, and I've only got another slide to do, will be a focus on handheld devices and, and interaction, which is the way of the future. If you're not doing that, if you're just lecturing, video lecturing and giving PDF documents, you're, you're not there. Automated marking is, is a dream. I've achieved it for, for numerical subjects and it's great. Um, I'll just come back to AI and uh, grading essays, which is gonna be a mega challenge, but interesting. So where to next for, for uh, educational systems? Well, I think the next big point is what I would call adaptive learning. And this is where the kind of AI starts to come in. What do I mean by that? This is where the AI actually is, is recording everything you're doing. You're trying things, you're giving answers to questions, you're getting graded and so on. It's tracking your progress. Um, I know that's a bit scary and so on, and it is. Um, I won't just discuss that now. That's another, that's another thing to talk about. AI, Internet of Things and privacy, that's a whole different thing, but it's, it's relevant. Um, 
It will be tracking your progress as an individual and it will be advising you where your strong points, your weak points are. And as you progress, it will be directing you to where you need to be going next. So in other words, it's giving you automated guidance. That can be done now. I've more or less got that in, in my own system now, that it tracks everything the student is doing. It can see what kind of things giving them trouble and it can direct them to, to concentrate and concentrate on that. That's part of automation. We don't have it generally yet, but it's not yet artificial intelligence. So what does artificial intelligence actually look like? Well, I think the first thing to say, and I hope the technologists won't disagree because I'm not a qualified, fully paid up technologist myself, um, we don't have artificial intelligence yet. And we're still miles and miles, years and years away from real uh, intelligence. We can have lots of things called pattern recognition and so on, and lots of things which are kind of quasi reasoning, but no true human equivalent reasoning. And thank God for that. So there is still room for humans. That, 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 that's at least something to take comfort in. Um, the full AI would be some sort of cyber type robot that could talk and you could talk to. Um, more realistically, to begin with, we'll use what we would call chatbot technology. This is based on something called natural language processing, where, in fact, the machine can more or less understand, not really, but in a, in a certain specified way, it can understand and act on um, natural language that you type in or with speech recognition, which you say. So already we've got the, we've got the Google, we've got the uh, awful... Um, Microsoft thing, uh, the assistants and so on, uh, which I always turn off. I don't know about you. I can't cope with it yet. Siri, Cortana and all this. I, I don't like it. Too creepy. But I'm sure people will get used to it eventually. Um, and the, these things will be able to ask questions. Um, so one of the things that teachers do is help students understand. So when they can't do something, you ask the, you ask the tutor, the tutor will explain it to you. Um, I actually started talking to one or two AI companies, and I'm happy always to, to hear of any more, where the chatbot technology, which actually is used at the moment mainly, I believe, to automate things like customer call centers, hmm, big problem in India, I think, one of your, one of your big exports. Um, if this is getting more automated, so the idea is you phone up, you ask your question, and the machine will interpret your question and actually give you an answer or direct you to where you can get an answer. So I think that will be a very, very easy next step, actually. Very, very easy. Um, so then the big question is, and I can see my colleagues here, although, dare I say it, they're all looking, most of them looking like me, uh, well at, at or around retirement age. And I don't normally like using the R word, by the way. I try to avoid it whenever I, whenever I can. Um, so uh, what's the lecturer going to do? Um, now, that is a very good question, because if we got this AI, our lecturer is going to be the casualty of this great decimation of the workforce. Um, it's part of the bigger question about AI and robotics and so on and so on. Just one thing I will say, that maybe give a bit of hope that there is something for us to do. Um, uh, robots can't and may never be able to really fully reason like humans. So in terms of tackling a problem, they'll be able to go a long way. Medical diagnosis, they can look at databases and look at probabilities, it's this or that. Yes, they can go a hell of a long way. They can never give, they can never give full reasoning. I believe one thing that a robot could never do, and that is give inspiration. One of the things which teachers should be doing to students is give inspiration, make them want to be passionate about the subject, want to do to do more. You're going to be a long way from getting a robot to do that. So with my with my subject, um, which is maths, for example, my original subject, um, you're going to have a job getting robots to be able, fully be able to do that. But for things like things like professional skills training, there's, uh, there's certainly a future. So I think that's that's all I really wanted to say. In summary, um, I think the a lot more thinking needs to be done um, in long term planning of what's going to happen to workforces when artificial intelligence develops. In education, I think we're not going to go back um, to where we were. I think there'll be a lot more online. But the social the social part of education is crucial. Um, the friends you meet at university will probably last you your lives, the networks you build up and so on. That can't all be done easily online. 
So some thought needs to be given. What is the social element exactly? How does it link in? And how can we use much more powerful uh, technological methods to disseminate education um, to, achieve, to achieve a lot better than, than we have so far? So thank you. If you have been, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, David. We are running a bit uh, tough on time. So Rahul, if you can have a quick five uh, minutes. Yeah, so I will, uh, I will have two, three minutes, I guess. I just, uh, I think I'll go back to the topic that we have for the evening and then, you know, sort of help get into questions. The question we started with in the beginning today was building economic and business resilience, ability and sustainability post-COVID. Now, if I turn that around into a question, uh, and that's something I would like to talk about is how does a business do that? Uh, and, and to be honest, an organization which is resilient, uh, you know, is resilient from a DNA perspective, regardless of the environment uh, the organization faces. I mean, we have gone through uh, various ups and downs in this economy from Y2K to the 2008 crash now to the pandemic. And I think there are organizations that have uh, sustained themselves before and there are organizations that have not been able to sustain themselves before. And I think we're going to see a very similar trend going forward as well. Now, there are two sort of pieces of recommendation that I want to uh, uh, lay it out there for those who are in a similar situation and circumstances. If you're building an organization to be resilient, you need to build that organization at three levels to be resilient. A, strategically, B, operationally, and C, individually. So if the organization is not strategically uh, structured to be resilient, i.e. they're not structured to deal with the environmental changes on an ongoing basis, uh, the chance of that organization surviving a pandemic or even another crash is low. So you need to make sure that you have systems and processes that ensure that organizations are structured to be uh, resilient at the strategic level. At the operating level, uh, of course, you want to make sure that organizations are also uh, agile and resilient. Uh, an example of that would be on the education side when we went through this whole uh, downtime downturn. We need to we had to move all our on class on campus initiatives offline. Whether it was examination, whether it was uh, placements, whether it was enrollments, uh, and you need to have an agile structure uh, and a technology to be able to do that. Now, oftentimes people confuse technology. Uh, as a solution. Um, my perspective on technology is it's just a tool. How you apply technology to solve a problem is what matters. And that's where the focus of the team should be. Um, so operational uh, resilience is the second part that I think is very critical for an organization to sustain itself. And of course, the third part is the individual resilience, which is the leadership, right? So you want to make sure in an organization, their leaders who are resilient and agile as well, and therefore their teams are resilient and agile. They're able to learn, unlearn, relearn at all given times to adapt to any change that the market sort of goes through. If you're able to do these three things uh, properly and well, I think you should be able to look at uh, facing any kind of an uptown, upturn or a downturn in an economic situation. So that's sort of my first submission uh, in terms of my recommendation. The second part uh, I want to talk about is the sustainability part of it, you know, which, which is also part of the question here. Yeah. When you look at sustainability, I think, you know, it has to be market driven. You know, you need to, one of the things I always tell my team is, what's the job that a consumer is hiring you to do? And if you can ensure that that job is done, you know, he or she will always hire you. So you want to, like in our context, from an academic perspective, we ask that question that what's the future consumer looking like? Why or why would he or she uh, come and consume a product of yours, which is, let's say, a business school or an online product or an in-class product? Um, and if you're able to uh, satisfy him or her by giving a solution, you will always be in business. Now, the only thing is once you've understood what the requirement is, all you need to do is internally align your resources, processes, and your business model to feed that. So the second recommendation is be market driven and then align your resources, your processes, and your profit formulas to ensure that you're able to sort of feed that market. And in the entire process uh, of resilience and market driven, what is also very important 
is for your other stakeholders, the external stakeholders, governments, in our case, corporates, uh, vendors, all of them should also be resilient for you to be successful. So you want to make sure that you're working in partnerships with stakeholders as well, so that they're able to also sort of work with you hand in hand to go through the change. So I feel that one way of looking at solving some of this problem is to look at collaboration more aggressively, to look at having more agile structure, um, to ensure teams are able to um, sort of uh, continue learning all the time so that they're able to move in a particular direction. And a combination of all of these three things put, put together, uh, you should be good to go. So I think I just wanted to drive these two main points uh, for the evening, which, uh, which, are, which is coming from an institutional perspective in terms of those who are listening to us today uh, of how to drive change. And the good news is we ran a poll you know, some time back and we asked this question about how resilient and agile were organizations pre COVID. And about 64% of us thought we were somewhat resilient, which is a good news. I think that many of us think that we have some, um, uh, you know, some, some bit of process or resources in place. Now we all need to do is we need to get that percentage higher and higher and higher. So I think that's some uh, good data to sort of share with everybody in, uh, publicly as well. With that, I will, uh, I will move back and deepen to you and then let's get to questions because we are already running out of time. Thank you, Rahul. I know we are running out of time, so we just quickly come to the questions. There are quite a few questions, and instead of what I was thinking, so I've gone through some of the questions. Instead of, I mean, focusing questions to everyone, I felt uh, that there is one very interesting and a very simple question, which I think all of you should speak at least uh, about uh, 30 seconds on that. And that question is very simple. And more than, uh, more than one of the person they've asked it, they have said, I'm an engineer, I'm an MBA. What is the, and, I, and my parents have spent a lot of money for me to go to a residential school and a residential college, lots of times in labs. So is uh, this okay for my future? Or in future, different sorts of, I mean, education uh, will be required and different sorts of uh, people will be coming out. So. That sort of a feeling that if there is so much of change or a revolution going to happen in education, what is going to happen to the lab work? What is it going to happen to the comradeship between people, the friendship, and what we what we and what is very much looked after? Building of culture, building of character. So perhaps how you distinguish? There is one question: how you distinguish between academics and education? So. I'm just putting everything in one. And so I thought that if I just start with Tridip, just, I mean, and, and I want reactions from all of you in this, because this is a very common thing. And all of you have wide expertise to answer this question. Just a 30 seconds feedback. Yeah, the, the first question I would respond that this is the best time to be in a school. I mean, you, you at least have a year, year and a half to prepare yourself. And, you know, things will turn around, it, it, whether through, uh, remedies or medications or whatever it is, things will turn around. What is a better time than this one to be away from all this? The second question is the social um, interactions and building of uh, a group uh, feeling. That That is something is a challenge. I mean, it's really hard in, in our school. We are grappling through that. How can we create um, a scenario where people can get together I don't know whether chat rooms or, uh, or Zoom or any other situations, at least temporarily, we can create a topic for them to decide and then uh, exchange ideas in there. And then, you know, through the chat group interactions, you can create friends. You can create friends, interact with them in a little way. So the question is, uh, can it be longer term? Uh, the physical proximity is going to take some time before students can actually meet and meet other people and have a party or have a beer or anything like that. That's, that's not going to happen very soon. So unless you totally ignore your health health conditions and, and so on. So yeah. my th thinking Thanks. is that it's better to be in school at this time and the universities and the school should provide some opportunities for interactions through um, uh, electronic methods. David, do you agree to that? Please unmute yourself. 
Thank you. <laughs> Try again. Yeah, I do. I do agree with that. Uh, there's no substitute for actual physical interaction, of course. But this is a kind of second best does work. Um, the questions which I saw earlier were were more about, you know, what should I be doing? And is an, one question was, should I be doing engineering or an MBA and so on? Um, I think, given what I said, I'd be concentrating on those things which are going to be in demand in the future. That has to be thinking ability. Uh, problem solving and also being able to relate and deal with people are the crucial skills I think going going forward so you know not just technology uh, technical competence but being able to deal with people and really being able to solve problems and think is going to is going to be the the, the things that we need in the future Alfredo what do you think about it academics versus yeah. education Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I hear yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Uh, a difficult question, but thank you. Uh, yes, good time to be at school because there are no jobs after all. What else would you do with your time? Uh, one, one alternative would be to find out what people need and try to solve those problems. Now, uh, if you don't have that acumen at this time, go to school and the schools should be thinking more thoroughly what to offer its students, uh, in, in what time slot, uh, on what topics, and schools still have to do that homework. Regarding the uh, socialization aspect of it, of course, you can't get together, you can't tap each other, you can't hug each other, so it has to be done at a distance. But there are many ways in which you can do it, bring people together along their tastes. For example, you could offer live music uh, and then ask people to coalesce and chat about it. Uh, art, for example, could be shown online and ask people to come and to train them. Art is an excellent way to train people to look ahead. You know, art sometimes is rather cryptic and it needs to be decoded. Now, that ability to decode is what uh, best executives need in order to read the weak signs that usually come before the crisis and which was lacking, very much lacking in the response that we had to the COVID-19. We saw the COVID-19 coming closer, but we thought it would never reach us. No, our companies were caught by surprise, they say. But why? Because the executives could not see it coming. They did not have the antennas, the feelers out there. Decoding art, literature, contemporary art uh, are very helpful. And they actually help to get the students together and get to know each other as well. Those are just ideas to, uh, to try to answer a very difficult question. <laughs> Dr. Nair. Yes, uh, I, I see it in a way that, yes, uh, I think the graduates of the future, I think I'm yes. unmuted. So I think the graduates of the future will have to look at what are the future industries or the future skill sets that's required. But having said that, I think one of the key things that the future graduates need to be is ambidextrous in the sense that they've got to have strength in a particular discipline areas, but also breadth of knowledge in other areas which means that they need to be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. The reason for this is that because we're seeing technology and knowledge platforms are converging. So they'll have to, you know, be very strong in their mechanical engineering or whatever other areas, but also see where the applications are. And for them, they need to really then understand the technology ecosystems, the economic ecosystems, you know, entrepreneurship, human systems that are changing the human dynamics, the social systems and so on. So think of what a, a mechanical engineer of the future would be. They would need to know whatever devices that they, they put in place, many of the devices are now converging with biological systems and human systems. So they need to understand human behavior, leadership. There are different types of leadership styles. So we're gonna see that you know people with single discipline are going to find it very difficult because a lot of the grand challenges that we face today are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. So I always say I'm coming from a, a multidisciplinary area from mathematics to going into behavior and behavioral analysis. I'm able to use some of the mathematical analysis to understand human behavior. And this is what you're going to see the engineering schools and the architectural schools, even the medical schools, you know, 
the, med the medical people need to know about human systems, public health systems, technology. So we're going to see that graduates of the future will need to be ambidextrous, strong in discipline areas, but a breadth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Rahul, you have um, trained 180,000 people. Hands on. No, sir, I think I agree to uh, what everybody has said in the panel. And I'll add just one quick thing, which is while the student, like uh, Professor Mahindran said, has to also look out for the relevant courses in the future in terms of the sectors which are growing, I would also uh, ask the students to look at what they really love to do. And I think that's a very important question as well. Because you know, if you look at adults, postgraduate students mostly are, I mean, adults can't be taught unless they want to learn. And you know, that's the basic science of andragogy, right? So in the sense, if, if somebody wants a more skill-based job, or if the focus is a job, there's typical type of programs you can go into. If the, if the focus is research and PhD, there are different kinds of programs available. I would also urge the students to ask what kind of field and what kind of uh, a goal they have so that they can align themselves to the relevant program in the relevant institution. So that would be sort of my add-on feedback to the overall uh, you know, view that people have. Can, Great, I, thank you. can, I, can I add yeah. one, one more point? Can we create this current situation as an opportunity sure. to teach leadership? You know, we used to have uh, student groups and I used to have a faculty as a faculty advisors, we would go and tell them, okay, go recruit your people, go find a project, do something uh, and make presentations. So all those will have to be online though, but I think this might be, uh, we can turn it around and create this as an opportunity, opportunity to teach leadership uh, among, the, among the people because it's a tough problem. Thank you. Great. I know we are out of time, but we still have more than 460 people. So maybe just one more question. We just quickly go around. It is, again, a very common question. And it is on leadership. I think all of you should have your, I mean, uh, I mean views on that. In the post-COVID period, I mean, uh, let me not use the word post-COVID. COVID is very much there. When the, uh, let us say, the unlocking has started, the lockdown is over, the unlocking has started. So in the post-unlocking period, what should be the priority of the government? So what leadership the government should give vis-a-vis -vis two things, building business, that is building the economy or saving lives, keeping it in mind that in a country like India, I mean, it is from the Indian people that there are lots of people who are not going to have food and all these mechanizations, artificial intelligence and things like that are not going to create jobs. They will destroy jobs. Supply chain, automation are going to destroy jobs. So what should be the priority? Looking after the people or looking after the economy? And again, if you don't have economies, you can look after the people. So let me start with the leadership, uh, Guru. Alfredo, you're on leadership. So what should the government do? Unmute. OK. I would put money into people's pockets and let them decide what to do with it. That would be the best leadership, the answer that I would have. You know, they you need, need food, print money? they might need clothing. Uh, uh, you yes, print, print money? money if what is it? Yes. We we can print money if necessary, but, you know, it will deal with inflation later. But, you know, if we don't have the people because they die of hunger or, or they get into rioting, we, we need actually people to be able to survive. And the best thing that we can do is give them the money because as leaders, we should be taking care of their livelihood. And this is something which has not been adequately dealt with. In a very short answer. Great. Put money I will, in I will, people's I will, pockets. I will go to Professor Nayak. So do you agree that we should print money, lead to inflation, and are we creating more <clears throat> jobs or are we destroying jobs? So I think the first thing is that I think you can, uh, governments can only provide uh, financial support, direct cash transfer to people for a short period of time because you're going to have a ballooning of budget deficit. But this is where I think, you know, where um, the firms and government and the people need to play a, you know, a partnership role. Yes, I think technology is going to take some time, but 
firms are having difficulty because if you want to get people to work, you need to, and you want to save lives, you need to have very strong standard operating procedures in place to ensure, you know, uh, cleanliness and ensure, you know, uh, distancing and so on. That's going to cost firms. And if at all any support is going to be provided to firms, government can provide support to firms to adapt new technology, adapt better standard operating procedure, and employ people. And I think that is the first step in the inter in the immediate step: supporting firms to create jobs, maintain jobs, and then put in more longer-term funding for them to adapt to new technology and capability development. So it's a staged approach. If you give direct cash transfer to people. You can only do that for a short period of time to get the consumption going. Yes, yes, I would yes. rather see in the medium term that support is given to the corporate sector to adhere to better standard operating procedure, you know, better adapting, better technology, and eventually I, transition I, towards I, more I agree with you. It's not only a question of giving money to people, but to, to use it wisely. If you leave the current leadership to decide who deserves yeah. the money, the, you, we, you will probably be producing the same things as before. And that yeah. might have no demand. So my so, idea is to signal the demand where it's coming from, and then the companies will provide the goods that are being demanded. And and I think the key thing is that in companies that invest into technology and put people to work should be given better tax provisions. Okay. So taxes need to be adjusted to okay. ensure that yes. you know people are employed. So so you keep the engine of workforce going at the same right. time. Supporting yes. industry, you can't do. This. And this better is where best in the future. <clears throat> this is where you can break off the trade-off between saving lives and livelihood. Is that fairly well curated strategy from government in terms of incentivizing the corporate sector? So it's a partnership model. Thanks, uh, Professor Nair. David. How do we create more jobs? We all are supporting the people, very rightly so. So how do we create more jobs? I have no idea. Um, but I will tell you that uh, in, in answer to the first question, you threw that curved ball at me there. <laughs> but in answer to the, the yeah. first question, what should governments do? Actually, I think governments, first of all, they should have a plan, a long term plan, because we've never had a long term plan, actually. Um, not, in, not in my country. I don't think in your country. Uh, maybe other places in Asia it's possible, uh, but I'm not an expert. Um, so I would like to just disagree, if I may, about the idea of just giving, handing out money and printing the money. Well, actually, we've already done that. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we've noticed since 2008, we've been printing money hand over fist. And, and actually... But giving it to the wrong people, we bailed banks out. Well, yeah, um, and there's lots of th economic theory to justify why why that's a good idea. Um, but will people actually will people make the wise decisions? Um, people, frankly, are buying. I mean, our system works on millions. Okay, okay, David. Yeah, just continue. Our, our system works on millions and millions of people having money in their pockets. It's true, and pretty well being directed what to buy in consumer terms yeah. by social media. Actually, give it to so, the mothers then. Mothers know. Okay, give it to the mothers. So uh, my answer to the question is: What should governments do? They should they should have a plan and think through this of what how it can be managed. They can't control it. But they can manage it to mitigate the worst features. No, no, no time for a plan. <laughs> well, that's how we got can to I COVID. On... That's how we got can... to COVID. There was no plan, and that's where we ended up where we are. I think we. So, uh, I think we lost him. But uh, I just want to respond to the jobs question. Can I quickly do that? Sure, um, yes, yes. I, I think one of the ways one can look at uh, job creation. First of all, I feel that there are tons of jobs available. Uh, it just we don't have skilled people uh, who can take on those jobs. I mean, you know, I've been looking for people in the last one month um, across different sectors to, to get them placed. It just, we have not found them. So I think the question is uh, not whether there are enough jobs, but whether, whether we have enough skilled manpower to align them to the requisite jobs. And I think that's where, uh, uh, sir, I was just taking yep. on the question. On, so I was can we on move? The so... So, so the question is, my recommendation would be if the government can reduce regulation on academic uh, and educational institution and allow them flexibility to build programs that align them with relevant skills, then I think we can solve that problem because I think there are enough jobs, just not enough people 
who can take those jobs on. I, I totally agree. I think you <laughs> know, uh, the, the, the government's job is not to create jobs. Government's yeah. job is to support the industries to create jobs, which means yeah. you know business friendly policies, you know better regulation, incentivize them to to adapt to new technology, you know tax incentives and so on. I think you know that's the job of government. Can I can I add one more? Actually, thinking about it, uh, invest in education um, because that's the only thing that's going to give the longer term payback. Sure. And there's lots of ways they can invest in education, um, but that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I think totally. I think that's really important. I think that the workforce requires a solid education system. This is where the public spending is so important. Yeah, uh, Professor Muzumda, do you want do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I I agree with uh, Alfredo. Um, you know, we've been printing money like crazy. I mean, um, the, all, all these uh, banking frauds and so on. How many how many thousands of crores of money has gone out of the exchequer? Uh, we we can only guess. Yeah, I think and, that we are and, um, absolutely out of time, and I think, sir, we'll just end with Professor Mazumdar. Uh, two minutes. Yeah. We'll end with him. I think that uh, mm -hmm. we are really run out of time. The number of uh, delegates. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll anybody wants to say uh, something, or uh, I, 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 will I, I, it be okay that we conclude? No, it's not. No, yeah, it's sure, 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 sure. So I can, I can, I can stop here. But I, what I was going to say is, as uh, Dr. Banerjee, the recent Nobel laureate, is saying this. Even before COVID, they are grinding poverty in, in in many many cases. So giving money directly takes the money away from all the middlemen and so on. And uh, and COVID has made it even worse uh, that we should give money for food, clothing and basic shelters to the people for now. Uh, you know, what will happen? The, do, uh, the uh, rupee will be devalued a little bit. What difference does it make? Uh, it's not like one of the stellar currencies in the world. Can I say something? Um, does, this, does this lead us nicely into the uh, are we overpopulated debate or is that for another time? Because I think you've just, you've just opened that question. I mean, pandemics, I, I, heard a, I heard a zoologist so, about 10 years ago, he said, we're going to suffer massive pandemics. Why? Because humanity is living at a population density about 20 to 50 times what is sustainable in the natural world. And we're still animals. And this actually, population density is increasing and increasing. And what is more, population density is moving more and more to the coasts, God help us. So with climate change and pandemic, you know, the need for a plan is really there, has never been greater. Are you saying couples are spending more time together? Or? Pardon? <laughs> are you saying couples are spending more time together? Is it's that the saying, population? And, yeah, no, well, no, no, no. well, probably. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> oh, well, quite obviously with population growth, that seems to be Rahul, the Rahul, you want to add to that, Rahul? No, oh, so I think uh, I sort of agree with uh, what the panelists have said, I think uh, we should try and taper this down now um, uh, towards the closure, I feel. Let us get together again for an exchange okay. rather than presentation. Otherwise, we can go on for hours, I can tell this. You know, this is, a, this is becoming exciting now, uh, after two hours. We still have uh, we still have about 400 people uh, logged in. So, Wait, Rahul, I think we have had a fantastic... Yes. I, I wanted to thank thank the audience for being. You see, now we were just getting into a. Absolutely, it was getting exciting, but I think people are also dropping down. I'm I'm watching the numbers. Yes. So I yes. think we can include uh, 360, but I think that we should close now. It has been a one. So Rahul, maybe you want to do it. <laughs> I think let me do that. I want to thank. With, the, those were uh, his final words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank the audience. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank all the panelists for being with us uh, for this uh, wonderful session. Maybe we should get together again and have another round of we this. And, uh, the audience loved it. And, and it thank soon. you. Very make, much. make it soon so we don't forget. Yeah, thank you very much for the audience sticking around. Thank this you round. very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, Pleasure afternoon, morning, wherever you are. 
Let thank me you. Do, let me thank uh, uh, you know Globston Business School for organizing this, and and, yeah. and of course the audience being patient is still. So they said thanks to everyone. Yes, we have done okay. it. We have done that. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rahul. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Mazundar. Bob. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.